Hello, everyone. Welcome to my latest interview here on the Disclosure Team channel. Thank you to everyone that's joining us live here on YouTube. And thank you to anyone that's listening to this further down the line on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So, guys, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Mr. Ralph Blumenthal. Ralph, how are you doing? Great. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, sorry, I'm just getting a message saying I've got a bad error connection. Bear with me. Sorry. Hmm. Why have I got a bad error? Just bear with me one second, guys. Okay. I'm really sorry. I've just got to change a wire. No problem. Technology. The gremlins always interfere on this subject. I'm telling they you. They do, don't they? It's very <laughs> bizarre. Can you see me okay, Ralph? Yeah, I can. Okay, we're just going to have to roll with it. So, yes, thank you so much for joining me, Ralph. I really appreciate it, and I can appreciate that you must be very busy at the moment with uh, with everything. No, I'm very, very pleased to be here with you. So, if it's okay, we just start out talking about your latest article on experiences that came out in the debrief. Um, can you just tell us about the process behind it and what made you want to put it out at this time? Well, um, it's, a, it's a, an article that really starts with the release of the UAP report of the task force on June 25th. Um, and the report, while disappointing to uh, some uh, people in the field because it was rather short and restricted in scope uh, and not what some people had been hoping for, um, uh, it, it, on the other hand, it made some very important uh, points and disclosures, particularly um, that uh, UAP, or the, which is the new word for UFOs, uh, exist physically. It, it was a confirmation by the Pentagon, the Director of National Intelligence, um, that these things, whatever they are, uh, wherever they come from, whoever is behind the wheel, why they're here, whatever reason, um, they exist physically, and that is a big leap forward for the government because for yeah. many years, as you know, they were uh, denying uh, you know, the reality of these and putting them off to hallucinations or fly specks on the windscreen or um, uh, you know, the planet Venus, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, as if, as if you know, people out there don't know what the planet Venus looks like. Um, <laughs> anyway. Uh, so they said that these things are real and that they represent a threat to aviation, uh, a potential threat. So those are two very important things. So I start off the article by talking about the report and then saying what the report doesn't say, of course, which is, um, you know, what these things are, who's behind them or what. And, and then I eventually talk about the experiences who have stories of encountering alien beings um, this is all anecdotal. It's not confirmed like, you know, the UFO sightings, but it's an important part of the story. Yeah. So did you have any hesitation when you're actually talking about experiences? Because, you know, a lot of people in the community, they like their evidence and their data and all that kind of thing. Whereas it's just m more like somebody's word when it comes to the experience of things. Did that worry you at all how it would be perceived? It doesn't worry me because I'm very familiar with the phenomenon. I mean, my book on John Mack, The Believer, is all about, you know, a prominent psychiatrist who uh, was captivated, not, not captured, but captivated by the stories of ordinary people who had these uh, inexplicable encounters with, uh, with beings. Um, so uh, something I'm very familiar with, I'm also familiar with the lack of, you know, of evidence backing it up, except, you know, fragmentary bits of ev evidence we can talk about that convinced John Mack that there was something to this. Um, so I really had no compunctions about talking about it. I, I know there's a ridicule factor involved, yeah. less so now with UFOs, because as I said, the government has established their reality. Um, but certainly we're not there yet with experiencers and there's a lot of room for, uh, for doubt and, uh, and skepticism. That's all good, but we have to take these people uh, for what they are, which is well-meaning, um, ordinary people with, uh, experiences that cannot be explained. Yeah. And I think experiences voices have been pushed to the wayside for, uh, for too long now, you know, I think it's time that they, 
they are, are really thrust into the, the forefront of this story. So, yeah. Um, you mentioned John Mack and the book you wrote, uh, The Believer. Um, can you just talk a little bit about John Mack for those that might not be fully aware of actually who he was and the work he did? Sure. Uh, so John Mack was a Harvard psychiatrist, uh, very distinguished in his profession, uh, who had written a Pulitzer Prize winning book on uh, Lawrence of Arabia, T.E. Lawrence. I spent a lot of time in the UK and the Middle East, you know, researching that story. He'd gone to the movies with his wife to see the film, like everybody else of, of you know, that generation. And everybody else walked out of the movie saying, boy, it was a long movie or what a great movie. But he said, I got to find out about this guy, uh, Lawrence. And he really jumped into it and he did a, a psychobiography of Lawrence, a very interesting uh, portrait of Lawrence. He talked to uh, Lawrence's uh, family, uh, brothers, uh, ex-girlfriend, etc. So um, he was very distinguished as a, as a psychiatrist. He had um, traveled the Middle East on peace missions growing out of the book. He had protested nuclear weapons because he was a social activist. Um, and he had written a book on childhood nightmares and he had written a book on childhood development. So, um, I mean, he was really well-versed in the field. And then through a series of steps I outline in, in my book, The Believer, um, he becomes aware that um, ordinary people uh, have had these encounters which could not be explained. And uh, he, because he's a courageous guy and he's not worried about his career, which he probably should have been a little <laughs> more, <laughs> uh, he jumped into it and uh, collected a circle of these experiencers or abductees. Experiencer is a little better word because it's non judgmental. Um, and he, he started really researching because, again, he was a, a psychiatrist who had great standing in his field. He looked at the issue from the standpoint of somebody who knows mental health. And he quickly realized uh, that these people were not mentally ill. They weren't crazy. They weren't making it up for, you know, publicity. On the contrary, they were running away from their experiences. So for all these things that he put together, he realized something was going on. Uh, that we can't explain. And to this day, uh, we can't explain it, Vinny. So yeah. um, uh, so that was it. And he wrote two books about it. And then he was, to finish the story, he was run over by a drunk driver in London uh, because he looked the wrong way, which is what Yanks do in London. <laughs> uh, um, and it was very sad. He was almost 75 years old. But um, in some way, he was ready for the next step. He was very interested in life after death and the survival of consciousness. So um, that became part of his story, his final, <laughs> um, you know, crusade, which he may or may not have participated in from beyond the grave. There's some stories I include in the book. But anyway, that's the story of John Mack. I mean, I think a lot of people have seen him pop up because of the aerial school case in Rua, Zimbabwe. Absolutely. Um, you know, he was a big part of that. Is that a case that you followed? Yes, uh, I devote a good part of the book uh, to that case because it really is one of the best documented cases of um, encounter alien, you know, encounters. Um, uh, school children at a school outside Harare, uh, a day school of uh, mixed race children, uh, all kinds, you know, from all back different backgrounds, uh, well educated, well brought up children. Uh, 60 of them at recess saw this craft land and two beings come out and they had telepathic communications with the beings and they later drew pictures of the beings, described them on camera uh, mm -hmm. for John Mack. Um, so it's a very well uh, documented episode, very mysterious. Uh, again, these children uh, you know, we're not making it up. They've not because for the books they had read or the movies they'd seen. They were really very innocent kids who were just reporting what they saw. And uh, because of that, it becomes particularly compelling. Yeah, absolutely. I think it is definitely one of the standout cases just because it has everything, you know, so many witnesses, the children specifically. So, yeah, I agree. Um, Apart from that case, are there any other cases of encounters or even abductions that really stand out for you that you really, you know, it, it's up there for you? Well, I, I spent some time in the book talking about, you know, the first major <coughs> case, the Betty and Barney Hill um, uh, incident of uh, it happened in 1961 in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, but it didn't come out really until 1965 because yeah. the couple 
I kept it secret. Again, they were ashamed. These people are not eager for these stories to come out. But anyway, it was a couple who were uh, happened to be an interracial couple. He was he was black and she was white, and they were very uh, devoted to each other. And um, uh, they were doing civil rights work, which is another reason they they didn't want their work to to, to suffer by this uh, strange story. But anyway, what happened is. Um, they were coming back from a belated honeymoon, and as they passed through the White Mountains, they, they saw a craft. This is what they described later. Um, it seemed to be following them. They had moments of, of kind of a blackout where they didn't remember what happened, but they were both taken aboard the craft by beings, the subject of various pseudo-medical experiments. Betty's dress was ripped later. His shoes were scuffed because he was said he was dragged along the, the, the ground. And um, afterwards, they were released unharmed except for a terrible trauma as they remembered the episode. And um, they eventually saw a very well-regarded psychiatrist, not John Mack, but a man named Benjamin Simon, who had done wonderful work with uh, post-traumatic veterans of World War II. He was also an authority in his field of trauma. And he studied them through hypnotic regression and uh, long interviews and um, uh, and could not understand how two people could have had, you know, these experiences. One person, you could say, well, the person is deluded or it's a it's a nightmare, as many, you know, skeptics, so-called skeptics say uh, it doesn't always happen at night, but never mind. <laughs> uh, they dismiss it as some kind of a aberration. But when two people have the same story, basically, it becomes a little more difficult to dismiss. So that was the first big case. Um, and um, that's that's one case that really stands out, along with the Ariel School case. Yeah. And um, there was one other case I'll mention quickly that, sure. that John Mack found very compelling. Um, there were two teenage girls had a sleepover. Um, and during the night, the mother of one of the girls went down to um, check on them, and they were missing. And she called the police. She was obviously terribly alarmed. The police searched everywhere. I couldn't find the girls. And a few hours later, they turned up back in their beds. And later, they uh, remembered or said they remembered seeing a UFO uh, outside the window and having some recollections of an abduction experience. So what made that case so compelling to, to John Mack was that here was a mother uh, witnessing the absence of uh, her daughter and her friend during the night while they independently remembered some kind of an abduction experience. So this was a, a, a fairly rare case of corroboration yeah. uh, of third party. So that, that, that case jumped out at me. And what, what year and location was that one? If you, if you um, I'm trying to remember. I mean, John Mack did his uh, interviews in the uh, early, in the early nineties. Uh, and this must have gone back a few years. So it probably happened in the, in the seventies or eighties. Right. That's definitely one I'm going to look into because that is, sounds fantastic. Um, so moving on, um, I think most people in the UFO community um, obviously know about the article that you co-wrote in December 2017, mm -hmm. which broke the story about ATIP. Um, but I'd like to discuss the article you wrote two days later on the trail of a secret Pentagon UFO program, which explains how the original story came about. So could you just give us a background about how the story came to you and Leslie Kane? Sure. Um, well, I'd been working on the John Mack book since 2004, so I was sort of in, in the field. Um, and in the course of this, I um, got friendly with Leslie Kane, who's probably the foremost authority in UFOs uh, in the country or the world, because she'd written a book um, in, I believe it came out in 2011 on, or 2010, I'm not sure, on uh, generals and pilots going on the record. Uh, about UFOs, not only in this country, in the U.S., but uh, in other countries where they're often more forthcoming. Anyway, she's a recognized authority, investigative reporter, and um, we'd been exchanging information. And one day she came to me in, 20, in um, October 2017 and said she had attended, just attended a meeting in Washington, D.C., where um, Lou Elizondo, the head of this Pentagon program that until then was unknown, uh, the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, ATIP, um, which had been monitoring UFO activity for the Pentagon, um, he was resigning because he wasn't getting enough support from the, the Defense Department. 
Yeah. So, um, number one, here was an agency that we didn't even know existed. Uh, we thought that the, the government said it was out of the UFO business with Project Blue Book <laughs> at the end of 1969. Uh, we never believed that, but lo and behold, uh, here they were, uh, you know, tracking UFOs um, with a $22 million appropriation arranged by then Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, hidden in the Pentagon budget. Um, but here was this Pentagon office, you know, doing this investigation we didn't know anything about. The guy was quitting. And there were, you know, different uh, important people at that meeting. It was a secret meeting in Washington, but they let Leslie sit in on it. And they showed her these videos, uh, which we later got for The New York Times, two and then three, um, showing some of these encounters, which were very persuasive because they gave, you know, scientific um, backup credibility to what were mostly until then anecdotal accounts. So um, Leslie came to me with that story. Uh, I still had my contacts at the New York Times, but I had left the Times in 2009. I retired after 45 years, but I still uh, freelanced for them. Right. And um, I sent an email to the top editor and I said, we had this really sensational story, all on the record, by the way, no uh, anonymous sources, you know, uh, we had the um, uh, documentation, we had Lou Elizondo's uh, letter of resignation. So we had it nailed down. And to the credit of the New York Times, it didn't take much convincing. They said, wow, this is a good story. They put it on the front page on a Sunday, you know, shortly before Christmas, uh, with the videos on online. And uh, it, it did cause a sensation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, I mean, you wrote quite a few articles in the following following years with the New York Times. Um, but in one specific uh, article you wrote in July 2020, there was a part where you mentioned Dr. Eric Davis and how he gave um, classified briefings to the Defense Department, um, Senate Armed Services Committee, the Senate Intelligence Committee. And it was about off-world vehicles not made on this earth. Do you believe we have these craft in our possession or the government? Well, you know, what I'll say, Vinny, is that it doesn't matter what I believe. Here was a guy, uh, Eric Davis, uh, who had, uh, you know, great security clearances, who was briefing um, um, staff of uh, top um, Senate and House committees um, about uh, incidents uh, where... Uh, pieces apparently of off-world vehicles were recovered. Now, I'm not saying this, Eric Davis said this in a series of slides that he showed um, uh, staff of the committee. So um, that was really uh, one of the most sensational stories uh, you could imagine. Um, and, um, you know, afterwards, uh, some people online or, you know, on the web complained that the Times didn't, you know, say more about it. We said what we what we knew, what we could say that yeah. that this was th these were briefings um, of, of members of Congress, of congressional committees. Uh, a lot of this information is still classified, so we don't have access to it. You know, do I know for a fact that, you know, um, craft uh, off planet craft have crashed and been retrieved? No, I don't know that myself for a fact, but I know that Eric Davis um, briefed um, these congressional committees. We saw the slides that we used to brief them. So right. we were comfortable saying that Congress had been briefed on these uh, incident on some of these uh, re re reported incidents. So uh, I thought that was um, powerful enough. The Times agreed, uh, ran the story. And again, um it, it got tremendous uh, readership yeah absolutely i mean i think the crash retrieval conversation is is one that is constantly flowing and there's plenty of back and forth and arguments about it um even with things like the wilson memos or the um eric davis again being involved what are your thoughts on on those memos if if any at all well we haven't reported on it because um uh, it just hasn't gotten to the point where it's confirmed enough to report on. Uh, right. uh, you know, uh, Admiral Wilson denied the uh, reported meeting and uh, Eric Davis has not discussed it. So, um, you know, there's a lot of information on the web um, that doesn't necessarily hew to the same uh, standards uh, that we do at the New York Times. So, uh, you know, I'm just going to stick with what we can say in the New York Times 
and that I'm comfortable, you know, reporting. You know, we hear a lot of stories and people say a lot of things, but unless you have it on the record uh, from people who are credible, um, you know, we that, that's what we're reporting. We're not reporting speculation or we're not reporting anonymous stuff that's very hard to confirm uh, and that it doesn't carry the same weight. So we uh, and I think we've done it the right way because our stories have stood up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier about the UAP task force and the pre preliminary assessment. And now we've seen that there may be a replacement with a permanent office if the bills get passed and signed into law. Do you think it, it, we'll, we're likely to see that happen or do you think there may be sort of pushback at the, the final No, no, I stages? think that that's uh, well established now that it is interesting that uh, another agency is going to be created that will uh, perhaps have more standing uh, than the UAP task force. It shows again the government's commitment after many years of denial and, and misinformation and disinformation uh, that there's some goodwill here uh, to get at the bottom of this. This is obviously a controversy that has, uh, is of long standing. It's um, a matter of, of great interest to the public. I think the public has been ahead of the government uh, for a long time because the government was afraid, you know. We can't, we, we, the people can't handle the truth, but the people know what's going on because they're the ones who are reporting these things. And the government was the one who was saying, oh, it's marsh gas or, you know, <laughs> my specs on the windscreen. And um, so, um, so the public can handle it. And uh, uh, I think it's a good sign that, uh, you know, things, things are moving in the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. Um Moving on, um, I'd like to talk to you about the Galileo project and the work of um, Avi Loeb. Is that something that you you um, have high high hopes for or expectations? Yeah, I was on a show with uh, Avi Loeb. I have uh, I read his book. Uh, I think it's very compelling. Um, it, it is interesting uh, that he, um, I mean, he's at Harvard. Uh, John Mack was at Harvard, um, but they come. They have rather different perspectives or. or Avi Loeb has a very different perspective from John Mack. He doesn't trust human instruments like John Mack did. As yeah. a psychiatrist, John Mack dealt with human beings. Avi Loeb likes to deal with instruments. Uh, I understand that. He's an astronomer. Uh, he doesn't trust the anecdotal accounts. Um, and um, But he, he and John Mack agree uh, that the scientific establishment uh, has been too uh, narrowly focused, too blinkered, in uh, being afraid to you know, question some of its initial assumptions, uh, to venture into new areas um, b boldly, uh, which in certainly John Mack's case, to, to, to question uh, um, these extraordinary accounts of experiencers. In Avi Loeb's case, you know, he found this object, uh, uh, Oumuamua, that came through, the, through our solar system in 2017. It was gone before anybody <laughs> noticed it. But he says it, it had earmarks of a, um, uh, an intelligently controlled or at least intelligently built object, uh, the first one from outside the solar system. It was just, it, it, it deviated from its natural path, uh, seemingly because it was powered by um, some kind of a solar sail or, or some technology that, that powered it. So um, um, I, you know, I admire, I told him I'd be low himself. I, I admire what you're doing. I think it, it, it's also very bold. Uh, we, he and John Mack disagreed on the human factor. Um, and Davy Loeb doesn't talk about aliens at all. Yeah. But um, as I said, he thinks the scientific establishment has to uh, open up a little more and be more forthcoming. Yeah, I think that's, that, that, that's definitely the case. So do you think that we're more likely to get answers in the future coming from the scientific community rather than anything from the government or the military? Well, um, I think that it'll come from various places. I mean, the scientific community um, is uh, cert certainly, you know, SETI, the search for extraterrestrial life, is sending out radio signals, which John Mack found kind of antedated, by the way, and very anthropomorphic. I mean, radio signals <laughs> to advanced <laughs> civilizations. He said that's like looking for a good Italian restaurant <laughs> in the cosmos. Uh, but um, look, I think all the efforts to, to find uh, life, even single cell life from off the planet, 
would be revolutionary. Um, because if, if life developed even in very simple forms elsewhere, it holds open the possibility, obviously, that it developed um, uh, forward, uh, way of, past our stage of development. So it would be revolutionary. So I applaud all the uh, efforts to find, you know, uh, signs of life in rocks and, um, you know, in the atmosphere and in, in the gases and the cosmos, et cetera. So, um, um, you know, I think the, go the government is, is, may not be the first one to come forward with this information because it's always um, been wary of sharing information. And there's obviously a national security component too. They, they don't want to alert adversaries to how much we know uh, about this revolutionary technology. Um, so, uh, so perhaps the, the um, uh, academic community, the scientific community may, may find something out first before the government. Yeah, absolutely. And um, well, listen, Ralph, before we finish off, I just wondered if you were able to tell us about anything that you're working on currently or any plans you have for the foreseeable future. Well, I'm still, uh, you know, working on, on um, the whole issue of, of the experiencers. Uh, this article in the debrief uh, a couple of weeks ago was an effort to bring their stories to to the fore. I think they've they've really gotten um, a bad deal so far because uh, they they suffer from the ridicule factor. They are meeting in support groups um, to exchange stories to try to understand. You know, they have no understanding of why whatever happened happened to them. Right. Um, uh, what these beings represent, why they, why these people were picked out, they don't understand any of it. Uh, they don't pretend to know. Um, they, um, uh, they would like answers too. And I think, um, and with all the, the, and this is in my book. I mean, all the funding that the government has put into uh, taking, getting images of black holes 55 million light years away, and finding. Uh, the elusive missing particles of the universe, because 95% of the universe is unknown, dark energy and dark matter. We have no idea what what that what that means. What what composes the cosmos? So, the government has spent billions of dollars to answer these questions, but it hasn't spent very much on l looking at these people who've experienced these, who've had these encounters, whatever they are. And trying to figure out why, whether there have been any changes to their bodies, why these people were picked out and not other people. I've never had an experience, um, you know, with extraterrestrial contact. I've never seen a UFO. Why haven't I? Uh, these are questions, you know, what makes me different? What makes them different? Uh, these are, you know, interesting questions that would seem to lend themselves to scientific study. Um but there's still this, you know, uncomfortable uncomfortableness with the subject, and uh, I think it's held us back. Yeah. So, are you looking to write more articles, primarily focusing on experience? Yes, I'm. I'm looking to write more articles. And Leslie and I are, are continuing to monitor the field. Uh, Leslie Kane, and we're hoping to write more articles. Um, there's, there's a lot more to be done, but we want to pick our subjects and our targets and. Uh, you know, we were hoping to break more stories, but it has to be done the right way with the right background on the record, you know, with documentation. So um, <clears throat> we're definitely staying with the subject. Excellent. Well, I, I really look forward to anything that you're going to bring out in the future. And hopefully you join me again in the future to, to discuss that work when it appears. I would um, be delighted. I would be delighted. Thank you so much, Ralph. Um, and just to let you know, I will be putting all of your links in the description of this video below. So your book, your website, your articles, your old articles, and your latest stuff with a debrief so everyone can go and go and find it and look look at it all for themselves. But okay. finally, Ralph, no, oh, sorry, go on. No, I just really appreciate it. <laughs> and it's my pleasure, um, but I really appreciate you joining me today. Thank you so much. It's been, been a pleasure. My pleasure. All right, take care. Thank you now. Guys, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed that. And I look forward to seeing you on the next one. So take care. Bye-bye.